Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight, episode 128. And let's let's not beat around the bush. Ticks. Still, pro, uh, still out there. Still a problem. It's that time of year when a lot of people are going to start thinking, oh, summer's coming to an end. Temperatures are getting cooler. And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking like, you know, cold. But things are cooling off. It stops being on people's minds. Uh, but the reality is it's still a real problem out there. And you shouldn't let your guard down just yet. Would you agree, Ben? Yeah, I mean, ticks are a year-round problem now in Nova Scotia. Like, people are getting them in the winter. They're getting them in the fall, and you get them throughout the summer. Uh, there are definitely peak seasons where they, they tend to really flourish. And it's something I want to think of not flourishing. <laughs> but, yeah, no, it's something we have to be vigilant of. Uh, and just kind of be very aware of, of the types of places you're going to see them and the methods you can to protect yourself from them because they do carry disease and well anything that sucks my blood kind of irks me a bit you know what i mean gets under your skin gets under my <laughs> skin <laughs> but yeah the reality is that there's kind of some there's half truths full truths and complete misconceptions when it comes to ticks everybody thinks as the weather gets colder and i do mean colder uh we're talking about this earlier now just so it's out there and people are thinking off it but as things get cooler especially into the fall where you might have you know frostier mornings and stuff like that to think oh the ticks are going away because it's cold the reality is specifically the black legged tick which is you know very widespread in eastern canada especially here in nova scotia we're getting a lot of hot spots with black legged ticks and stuff like that as long as it gets above freezing at any point during the day the tick will stay active. Um, and and that's kind of the, the key thing to remember. And as Ben said, we're getting them throughout the winter because it's not uncommon for us to have, you know, plus temperatures in the middle of the winter anymore due to, you yeah. know, what whatever you want to consider, like climate change and things like that. It, it's, I can remember in January, I think I was walking outside in a t-shirt. Like, you know what I mean? It was still like one, two degrees outside. It wasn't that cold. Uh, for the time of year, and as long as it's above freezing, like, the ticks are going to be there. It is true that things like the um, the dog tick or brown-legged tick, the lone star tick, snowshoe hair tick, and a few other ticks as the cold weather comes in, they kind of, they slow down, which is true. Uh, and these ticks, they can carry some diseases and stuff like that, but nothing is, you know, as bad as Lyme disease. Well, I suppose now uh, they're saying the lone star tick or the, uh, I can't remember which one it is. It's coming out of New Brunswick. <laughs> if it bites you, it could potentially give you the allergy to red meat, which is kind of a, yeah, that, a new and interesting way to be scared of a bug. But yeah, that's that's a, a fate worse. Than... <laughs> that would be interesting. I I don't know how I would. I mean, I'd manage. I'd have no choice. That's the way it'd be. I just I can't picture not being able to eat any kind of red meats. And when they say red meats, it's not. I think it's strictly like the beef and stuff like that but i've also heard that could potentially lead to like pork and poultry it might only be fish that you're free to eat which i like fish but fish all the time nothing else tofu i guess you're good with that but that, that's not really a meat that's a bean right you can flavor it like meat and that's the best you can hope for is that even a food <laughs> eh, you know what we serve it at my work so i'm going to assume it's at least somewhere on the food scale it's an edible it's an edible <laughs> item <laughs> but uh yeah so ticks ticks are a real big issue uh Lyme disease especially in the later years has become a lot more known a lot more accepted uh i don't know about you ben but i remember a time not too long ago we're only talking like 10 years ago my family doctor at the time literally the words that came out of his mouth were oh Lyme disease isn't real that's something made up this is coming from a family practitioner and i won't mention who it was they're since retired so whatever. But from a practitioner saying, Lyme disease is made up, it's not real, you don't need to worry about it. And that's only 10 years ago. To where wow. we're at now, where people are like, oh, no, no, Lyme disease is real, and it's a real concern. And that's the thing. Like, people don't actually understand how much of a concern it can actually be. Uh, do you know anybody with Lyme disease, Ben? I do know people who've had Lyme disease. And my dogs have been treated for Lyme disease. Um yeah, I know a handful of people who have contacted it, been treated early, uh, and seem to be fine. I know of a guy who got got Lyme disease and has been struggling with it for years because I believe once it gets to a certain point, it's called chronic Lyme disease, and it's very hard to treat or do anything with. Um, and it has been a struggle. 
for some of these people to get treatment, to get uh, options, because it doesn't seem to be something that the, and I hate to say this, because I mean, the provincial government admits that it's a disease. They talk about it. They tell us to be careful about it. But the medical system doesn't seem to be doing as much for people as they, they are even doing for animals. Like there's mm. more treatments and stuff you can get for your animal than it seems like are available for for people or at least readily available. Um, I believe I had heard at one point there was even like a vaccine that was available down maybe in the States, but it's not so much here. I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the whole truth of it is. There's, It's definitely something that that I don't know enough about to say like, this is gospel and you need to believe me, but you know, it, there's a lot of misinformation out there. And unfortunately that makes finding the truth difficult because you have to weed through the misinformation and, and the, and the half truths and so on and so forth. And some of it comes from what seems to be legit sources. So it does take some research in the meantime, taking all precautions to prevent you from having that, exposure seems to make more and more sense to me right well i mean even if it's not for the ticks and i know tonight is ticks episode but it's kind of like an ounce prevention is worth more than a pound of cure let's say it's all fake or let's say you assume it's all fake more specifically is it really that hard to just prevent it on the off chance it might be all real and don't get me wrong i fully believe that it's absolutely real like uh I've been tested for it several times. When I worked at Natural Resources, I've had black-legged ticks on me. Uh, my dog, Pickles, who I uh, held up here a couple weeks ago, he had Lyme disease, and it was a long time, like relatively, before they actually uh, realized it was Lyme disease, such as you said there. It's uh, one of those things that's tricky to test for. The testing we have is okay, and I, I do say okay because um, it's not 100% accurate. You could have full-blown Lyme disease and the potential of getting a false negative is relatively high. Uh, or you could not have Lyme disease and the potential of getting a false positive is, once again, relatively high. The testing is, it's unfortunately not known well enough a whole ton about it. It is getting better. Um, but it, it, it's, it's definitely out there. Something's out there at the very least, you know what I mean? But it is easy to kind of prevent. Uh, well, I mean, it's easy to help prevent, as we said, with the precautions and stuff like that. And we're not just harping on you guys to get out there and be like, oh, yeah, protect yourselves, all this. It's, you know, it's not going to be that bad if you get it, but take your time to get it. It's actually pretty severe if you look up some of the symptoms. And I know specifically for my dog, um, what really tipped us off that it got really bad was like he was starting to lose uh, the use of his back, like his hind quarters. You know what I mean? Like his legs weren't working right. Uh, he was getting some weird facial tics going on. Uh, his teeth were rotting unexplicably. I am, dear. Um, and these were all things like we had him in. They tested him for Hodgson's disease. They tested, uh, they did blood work and heart work and a whole bunch of tests. And finally, it was just on a whim. They were taking him back out and it was like, well, you want to run a Lyme disease test. It's like only 150 bucks and it'll take 15 minutes. And at this time we were, what were we into it for, Mel? A couple thousand dollars? Something. Anyway, we're into it for a couple thousand dollars. I'm like, what's another 150 bucks? Went out back. Uh, wonderful vet, by the way. And she came out and she was holding the test strip and she's like, well, green means that he has Lyme disease. And it came out like that color. You know what I mean? Like it was green green and they're like he definitely has lyme disease put him on antibiotics seven days later wouldn't know it was same dog like what are we that quick to fix it so molly had it uh I'm pretty sure it was molly uh one of our dogs had it for sure and uh we noticed one paw like she was limping and then we looked at her like a few hours later and it was the other paw that was limping and we we're like that was weird but maybe we we misremembered the first one. And then it was a back leg. I mean, no, no, it was a front leg before. So it was moving around her body. She went in and mentioned it to, to our vet. And our vet, they're, they're to the point now where they just, they test for Lyme disease almost right away. Like, that's one of the first things they do, right? Uh, so they test it. But uh, it was going to take some time to get the results. So they just actually started treating us right away for it. And then contact us like a few days later and say yes it was a Lyme disease please keep continue your treatment under sort of the impression that doing the treatment if it's not the issue wouldn't make it worse 
And if it was it, it would be best to start early. So that's how they, they went for us. Um, there is one question from the comments there. Uh, Steve says, Ben, do you attribute your dogs having Lyme uh, with with the woods or being in the woods? Uh, no, I interpret it to them being inside my, my lawn, actually. And that's exactly uh, where but, Pickles got it from here, too. What are we? Yeah. It's just a small field out back. And he goes in it sometimes, and that's the only place we can think he picked the tick up. Um, although my dogs do go in the woods with us, and we have removed ticks, usually the mo most of the ticks we've ever gotten have have been our yard. And the big thing for that is, you know, to keep your lawn cut uh, down, because they too, do tend to like longer grass. You're more likely to pick them up from there. But the reality is, if they're in the area, it's hard to 100 percent avoid them and there's areas they they frequent now i have a cabin on the south shore the south shore in nova scotia is, is quite known for having heavy tech tick populations that's not to say the entire south shore is we've seen very few in my cabin area but we have seen quite a few in neighboring areas um so i don't know if we've ever picked up a tick while at our cabin but we have picked up ticks in that general area so you know, you just have to be careful. Oh, for um, sure. Um, if people don't know how ticks work, just a tiny bit of information on them, because I don't want to pretend I'm an expert. But ticks are opportunistic uh, parasites. What are we? They're a parasite. Like, they attach to a host, they suck blood, all that good stuff. But they don't actively seek out a host. They're not wandering around, they don't jump, they don't fly. It's nothing like that. Once they hit the stage where they start drawing blood, they literally climb up on longer grasses, lower branches, bushes, stuff like that, to the height they figure the prey they want is going to be, and they just wait there with the little tendrils on the back of them. They have, like, these hooked legs, and they just dangle them. And if something comes by, and they say that they're attracted to smell or pheromones or whatever the case may be, they, ta you know... They just transfer over to that and off they go. Like they, they, you have to brush up against them. Um, a lot of people say, oh, they can fall into trees and stuff like that. It, it's highly unlikely. I'm not going to say they can't, but it's very, very highly unlikely that they'll like f actively fall out of a tree onto you to try and get to you. Most likely it was a fluke. They fell out of the tree at the same time that whatever was walking under them. Uh, and most ticks are like that. They just, they're, they're like, they're not ambush prey. They're not even actively looking for prey. They just passively wait for prey and then they get on you and then they look for the uh the warmer and i say moister but more humid and least or less accessible parts of your body to try and get into because like most animals if you can get into somewhere like that it's less likely you're going to get picked out because those areas generally are tender uh which is better for them because it's easier to penetrate the skin and better for them because if it's a tender area you're less less likely like think of a deer it's not going to rub uh, a stick where it's potentially going to hurt itself you know what i mean to try and itch something off it'll probably just give it a shake or whatever the case may be and that transfers to humans too it's not uncommon to find them in like belly buttons uh under arms in behind your knee crease uh up and around your groin uh like these are all places that ticks favor not to say you're not going to find them on your arm and your legs because i found plenty in there as well but that's that's generally how they operate uh and a while back if you look on the atlantic bushcrafts facebook page i posted a, a fun little video there of a guy that kind of does funny nature videos and he did a wicked one with some humor on it that really explains how ticks work and the kind of their life cycle uh and i i recommend everybody take a look at that if they they have a chance uh Hey, Troy. Hey, I'd rather be outside. Uh, Troy says, we have taken lots of ticks off our 16-year-old dog over the years. It's still kicking. And that's that's another thing to keep in mind is ticks, if you get them off soon <clears throat> enough, um, and I, I say this generally because there's exceptions to every rule, if you get them fairly quickly, usually it's pretty unlikely that anything's going to happen. They t used to say that it takes 36 hours for Lyme disease to transmit, and then they said it was down to 24, and now they say if you have one on you, you know, there's always the potential there. And that's the truth. The potential's always there. The parasite for Lyme lives in the stomach off the uh, tick, and it doesn't actively inject the tick, or sorry, the, the Lyme into you. It's uh, It sits in the tick's stomach. It has to get absorbed through the tick and then come back out through a saliva glands, if that makes any kind of sense. And that's how you get Lyme disease. So it has to take time for that to happen. It's not instantaneous. Like, it's not sitting there and the tick is ready and loaded with Lyme to inject into you. Uh, once it attached to a host, the Lyme becomes active in the stomach and does its thing. Sorry, Ben, didn't mean to cut you off. Tried to get a few words in there a couple times. <laughs> no, no, good point. Um, 
and I wanted to sort of like because of the, the chain you're going there, that's why the removal is very important. Um, used to hear the one, oh, just put some Vaseline on, they'll back out. Well, they sit now say, like, if you do that, if you cover up their, the Vaseline, what you because they breathe through their arse, is my understanding. They're a nice newfie term for you. <laughs> um, by covering that up, they can't breathe, so they back out to try and, and breathe and, and survive. So they want to back out and get away from this, this ewy gooey material. Problem is, before they do that, they tend to regurgitate some of that blood back into your system while they're backing out. So if you can pull, it, pull, pull them off cleanly, you can avoid that whole issue and minimize the risk of transfer. So that's that's what you want to do. And that's where the tick tweezers and, and uh, the proper tick tools are a much better option than trying to hit them with chemicals and and essentially drown them with with something uh just getting them off and clean and the thing is when you're pulling them off make sure you get the whole tick mm -hmm. because if you're not careful you pull the body off but the head stays in there and that's not good because that's just the foreign body embedded in your body and you still need to get that off right uh so so be careful when you get it it's also a really good idea when you do pull one off to save it just take a little ziploc bag the dime style bags would be perfect for it you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, no. I was reading a comment over here, and I was just nodding in agreement. Uh, we'll, we'll cycle yeah. back to that. Yeah. And just save it. Or a little tiny glass jar. The little ones at the dollar store would be perfect. It's just something you can put them in store. Because if you are concerned later that it may have had Lyme disease, you can actually send it out to get identified and even test it. Um, to what? the average person, I think this is not a free service anymore. But... I was going to say, once upon a time, Natural Resources did it. They did it in Shubenacadie at Integrated Pest Management. Uh, they had since given it up. It went to the Museum of History in Halifax. They have since given it up. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know if you contact DNR, they'll give the information. But like you said, there is a charge in identifying it now. Uh, but if you don't have the tick, you're high and dry. You know what I mean? It's, it's easier to identify Lyme in the tick than it is in the individual that potentially has tick, uh, has Lyme, if that makes any kind of sense. And that's the same with a couple other um, things that come up from ticks, too. Like, we're, we're talking about Lyme because it's the hot topic right now, but there's other things you can get from ticks. Like, just straight down to, like, um, a skin infection, a blood infection. Uh, there's, like, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. There's... Uh, <sighs> there's a lot it's an interesting topic if you want to look up what ticks can give you we don't want to scare anybody so i'm not going to mention all of them but yeah there, there's other things so with anything that embeds itself into your body it's worth saving it for a little bit of time uh in a vial as ben said just cover it in 70 percent uh isopropyl and just throw it in the freezer or something for uh, a couple weeks maybe a month make sure everything's good and then off you go i've been told that uh wine disease can show symptoms as long as six months later i don't know that for sure uh but i have been told that by a couple relatively reliable sources so i i can't dispute it and i can't agree with it either way but it's food for thought yeah i, I i'm under the similar impression that symptoms can sometimes lay relatively dormant for quite a while and one of the big issues is the symptoms are not consistent or the same and they consist similar to uh they can have uh, neurological effects, cardiolog card cardio heart effects, and arthritis. Mm -hmm. So they attack basically to cause inflammation of different parts of the body, which causes different effects. And honestly, it makes it one of the harder things to diagnose unless you're testing specifically for that. So you can go in with different symptoms and they may diagnose you with something erroneously just based off the symptoms and not through any of any true effect and unfortunately some of these there's nothing to test uh for the alternatives so they it's it's just assumed that that's what you have um i think it's getting better i really do i mean i haven't got the direct medical experience i'm not going to see a doctor regularly to see if i may have it so no mm. but i think it is getting better for diagnosed i know people who've gone in and, and got diagnosed relatively quick and got treatments relatively quick as opposed to people years ago that, that went in and struggled to even get tested and had chose like even like homeopathic methods to control it to varying degrees of success. So, um, 
Uh, so a comment that came up here that I was not in agreement with, uh, Steve said, there's been so many removal methods and tools suggested, that's why the chat is important. Example, he's heard of a hot match head. Uh, and no. very similarly, uh, when I was growing up, to remove them from a dog, everybody always said, oh, just heat up a needle and stick into it, not the dog, the tick. And the heat will kill them and they'll just fall off. Which... It's not true yeah. at all. <laughs> like there is a ton of methods out there and things um, that people will suggest. Old wise tales like the Vaseline I've heard putting butter over it, motor oil, anything to kind of make them squirm out. As to taking a cotton ball with alcohol on it, you just swirl it around them, and that's supposed to take them off. Um, now there are a couple things that do work rather well, and there are these uh, tick tools, like tick removal tools. Not all tick removal tools are created equal, and that's a topic for another night, but I'll let you guys do your own research. Definitely get do some investigation before you just run out and buy the first one you see, uh, because they're not all created equal. Uh, there are some that are very good out there, uh, but my favorite method, uh, as was suggested in our comments as well, is needle nose tweezers. You get them as close as you can to your skin. Uh, and then just give steady, constant pressure, and generally they'll come out fairly easy as long as you're getting to them fairly soon. And as yeah. Ben had mentioned before, try and give the tick a little look after you're done. See if all the head and mouth parts are there. There should be a little head, and there'll be kind of like two pincers that come out. Um, ticks don't... They're not like mosquitoes. Mosquitoes, when they bite you, they stick their little sucker in. There is a specific name for it, but I'm going to call it a sucker. It actually goes through your skin, and then they use your own blood pressure to pump blood into them. Ticks, on the other hand... Uh, they kind of weave through your skin. They're so small, like your skin is kind of made like a mesh. And they take their mouth parts and they literally separate it. And then they kind of lap up the blood in between. Uh, that's why it actually takes a little longer for things like Lyme disease and stuff to transfer. As where malaria with mosquitoes is a little quicker and yada yada yada. Vector versus... Anyway, different topic. Um, but yeah... It's uh, so when you remove them, make sure the mouth parts are there because where they are kind of weave feeding or pool feeding, sometimes their little uh, mouth parts can get stuck in the skin. And as Ben said, that's a foreign body. That's still potential for a bad infection. Uh, always clean the area and keep an eye on it afterwards, even if it was only attached for a little while. Yeah, um, I'm just thinking that because I, I do do a bit of stuff for uh first aid and that's one of the things they just recommend tweezers uh I, I i do not recommend the flame methods i know there was the old twirl one you kind of mentioned with alcohol but i've even heard without like if you just twirl your fingers around i've tried that uh i've had never had success for one backed off for that no i you twisted know? the body off one and the head was stuck in then i had to take time and dig it out of my arm yeah. tweezers so, from then on <laughs> so now i go to the dead simple good like you say the nice uh pointy tweezers uh, something that's got a really good grip, you know, not all, you saw, not all tick removal tools are created equal and I agree, but not all tweezers are created equal either. Fair point. Uh, um, it's something that's actually worth spending the extra couple of bucks. You can go to the dollar store and buy a cheap pair, or you can go to the pharmacy and buy a more expensive pair. Honestly, where you buy it doesn't matter so much. Just make sure that they're really good and that they, they come together cleanly and neatly and and they have a really good grip to them uh if they're too sharp at the end they're just going to cut something off that's not mm -hmm. necessary you want to test it really test it with a hair see if you can pull a hair out over just breaking a hair off that's a good test in that's my actually opinion a good point i've never heard of that but that's actually perfect because the same way you would pull a hair out it's pretty much the same way you'd pull a tick out pulling a hair out by the root you don't want yeah. to break it off, like actually pull a hair out by the roots, like on your arm or where she had a beard hair or something like that. The way you would pull that out is how you would pull a tick out. Yeah, that's that's one of my go-tos. When I'm testing a, a pair of tweezers, just grab a hair and see if it actually pulls it out by the root rather than cutting it off. Because it cuts it off, it's basically too sharp, too abrupt, and you're trying to pull a tick or something. All you're doing is then breaking it off. You're going to slice it off. So just something that I use. Uh, I don't know that anyone recommends that, and I'm not saying that anyone else tells you but it's a good good uh method to go by so if you're testing a pair of tweezers just see how they work at that um have you heard of this atlantic i have and i had it in my notes to mention and i'm glad you brought it up let's hear your thoughts ben let's start with you you mentioned it you're going down the rabbit hole first well i i I believe, and I don't know a ton about it, but I've seen them in stores and stuff, and I haven't tested it, but I believe it is a, a, a more or less local product. 
and, and that's where I heard, heard first heard about it. And you do find them in stores and stuff around here. And I think it's mostly, I have their site up here, so I'm, I say, I'm saying I think, but I haven't read through everything about it. But um, so a little backstory when you're looking up information there. The way Atlantic came to be was there was a mother and her son. Her son had got a tick on him. Uh, he had contracted. Uh, I think he had gotten Lyme disease, and she'd done a whole bunch of investigating to see what was out there as preventative medicines. Uh, she didn't want anything too strong with, you know, high DEET and things like that, so she came up with a kind of formula of her own that's a little bit more homeopathic and natural, and uh, apparently it works really well. Yeah, it's, it's lemongrass is one of the ingredients in it. Uh, lemongrass, tea tree oil, and a few other things. They say proprietary components if I don't... I actually yeah. read the news article when it hit the paper. Yes, I still read a newspaper, if anybody can still believe that. Uh, and it was a good article. That's how I found out how it came to be, you know what I mean? Uh, and Steve yeah. says he saw the product in a store last week. I have yet to see the sto uh, product in the store myself, oh, no. but it, it, it's composed right here in Atlanta, Canada. Like you said, it's a it's a very local product. Yeah. No, I, I have definitely seen it in, in local stores, especially pet-related stores, and I meet, may have seen it in our grocery stores recently, too. So it is a product that's around. They have a decent little website here. The number is a one nine hundred number, um, you know. It, and I'll include the link to the website in the description of the yeah. video for anybody looking for and, it. I mean, we have absolutely no affiliation with them. We're not. We're definitely not paid by them. We're not sponsored by them. They they probably do not know we exist, and we're okay with that. That doesn't matter to us. We're, we we are, we do enjoy making people aware of local products um and we're not saying that it's the best product but if you're interested in something that's supposed to be a little safer that's locally sourced you know it's definitely a product to check out um if you're interested in something that's maybe a little bit more industrial a little bit better i would suggest because i'm if you go down to your local farm farmers co-op or a similar type store Go into the area where they sell products for horses, and I think there's a pro there are products in there you want to look for perithium. Perithium, something like that. It's generally yeah. horse and cattle spray is what you're going to find here. Yeah. Sawyer makes a product specific to humans. You can't yeah. find the darn stuff. It's not sold in Canada. Oh, there. that's why you can't find it then. Because I've been yeah. on a mission for ages to try and find it. Yeah, but you can get basically the same product. The Sawyer's product is just a very concentrated version of this, and... Guys in the States have been using it for years. I think it's much more available down there. But anyways, I, I'm, I've been told multiple times that you can get it. And I know like I, I'm in some farming sites and, and livestock sites where people talk about it all the time. You can go down the store, buy it. You can actually just soak your clothing in it, hang it out to dry for a few days, and it will last like 20 or 30 washes or something ridiculous. Like it's, it's pretty well good for the year. So... The only disclaimer I'm going to put on this is while you're doing that, be leery of waterways. Once it dries to your clothes, the product's relatively yeah. safe. While it's still in its liquid state, it is absolutely disastrous to fish. It gets in their gills and it blocks their ability to breathe. I also, I can't remember if it's cats or dogs, but one of them, it's not good for. The other one, Cat. apparently, it doesn't bother. Cats. It's not good for cats. That's why some of the tick and... and uh flea treatments you can get for dogs are actually considered toxic to cats because mm. i'm pretty sure it does include a certain amount of perithium and then there's a cat version that's probably just doesn't have that product in it uh i watched a i think it's the chickenlandia it's on youtube and it's just about chickens but she actually she treated all she moved last week or something she's in the pacific north west or whatever northeast coast or whatever that she's out there and she's she pushes for people to have like chickens in the backyard mm -hmm. and the reason i watch it. anyways she she was treating her 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 chickens with it because they can get scaly mite disease and this is one of the ways she treats them she said she doesn't do it very often because it is a harsher chemical and she uses more traditional methods but she was moving from one area to the other and she just wanted to know she was starting fresh with no disease, no no ticks, lice, those sort of things that could affect her, her animals. So it is kind of a bug repellent. Uh, if you go to Mark's work warehouse and buy the no-fly zone stuff, and I do have some of their products. My mm -hmm. wife has more. 
which is a funny story, and I'm not going to tell it again. <laughs> Play it safe, Ben. <laughs> uh, but anyways, yeah, it's pre-impregnated with the same stuff. It's the same idea. And basically, when you're wearing this stuff, it helps repel the bugs, and it's awesome. And ticks don't like it, and if they crawl on it, they tend to do poorly. And so it doesn't really stop them from getting on you, but it just stops them from living once they get there. So they will tend to drop off. So funny enough, Steve just asked, uh, is this a deterrent, or sorry, it is a deterrent, not a killer, correct? And I guess our disclaimer right from the get-go is everything we're going to talk about tonight is basically deterrent related. I can't think of any uh, actual lethal kind of stuff that you can put on your body that's lethal to ticks and not incredibly harmful to yourself. Um, Mm. But yeah, everything we're going to talk about tonight, I'm fairly confident, is going to be deterrent only. And that's all you're doing is increasing your chances to not get ticks on you. You know what I mean? Be it by masking your smell or having something they don't like or, you know, along those lines. The only way I know for sure to kill a tick uh, is basically by killing the eggs before they become uh, an adult. Because an adult tick is a very hardy insect. Uh, if you ever tried to squish them in your fingers, you'll understand that, like, killing a tick is not an easy feat, um, without getting pretty aggressive towards it. And the way to kill tick eggs, and this is, a, once again, a debate for another time, another chat, but you know how people burn their grass in the spring because they have the, and I'm going to say the illusion that it makes their grass grow back greener, which is, like I said, that's a topic for another, <laughs> another night. I can rant about yeah. that great. But what it does do is it kills tick eggs. Tick eggs are usually, uh, laid in the early sorry mid spring to early summer tick eggs get laid um and then they kind of or sorry early spring to mid spring let's just say spring it's sometime in the spring tick eggs get laid then they go to larvae uh larvae does uh drink blood as well and then they're kind of coming to their full adult cycle right around mid summer to late fall uh and then their full adult cycle and that's when the females are trying to get as much blood as they can to try and you know lay the next eggs next spring uh, to kill a tick, a black legged tick, I've always been told you need like two weeks off minus 32 weather to actually even put a dent in any kind of tick population and start killing them off. That's how resilient and how hardy these things are. So, pyrethrum, it does have a neurotoxic effect on insects, and it is derived from a flower. So, it's considered okay. somewhat natural. Um,. But it also has a repellent effect. So, you know, it's kind of works both ways. If it gets, if they get to it, it does have a neurotoxin, which kind of sort of shuts them down. But it also, like, I think they can smell it. They sense the effect it's going to have on them and they just avoid it. So it's, it kind of works in two ways. A lot of guys, um, they, they coat their hammocks with it. They coat their tarps with it. They coat, uh, because some people don't want it as close to their skin as possible. So it, it is a good product. Uh, just it has some issues. Like anything. And I mean, we're going to talk about a few other things here. That Anything that's not good for ticks is going to be inherently not great for most living things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, that is the overall effect. You know, if it's toxic to one animal, it's probably not awesome for other animals. Uh, especially if it's toxic for a wide variety of insects. I mean, insects are, are notoriously resilient. What was they said one time? Like when humans are gone, cockroaches will still run the earth. Well, cockroach is like one of the few animals that can survive a nuclear blast. Right. Uh, water bears, I think, being the other one, and they can actually survive the vacuum of space. So yes. <laughs> but so I believe there's a whole bunch of them on the moon right now. There could be. Um, so yeah, Steve, you basically to kill them. You got to crush them. Uh, if you pull them off your body and you get them off successfully, and you just throw them away. They live to bite another day. So when you pull one off, that's why we suggest you throw it in a tube and keep it. Or you can basically crush it out of existence, honestly. Or you can burn them. I mean, uh, when I catch them in the fall, I usually pull them off and throw them in the fireplace kind of deal. And that puts the end of them. Hopefully. Because I've had them. uh, They always say, you know, like, wash your clothes in hot water and then dry them on the highest cycle. And I've done that and then seen a tick crawl out of the dryer. So not a guaranteed method to get rid of them that way either. But... uh, uh, I'd rather be outside. I've used it, and it works well to keep them from crawling onto you, much like uh, permethrin. So yeah, 
yeah, he's talking about the Sawyer stuff there. So, and it is a good thing. And we'll talk about a few other ways too. So why don't we get into that? We've talked about a half hour on what ticks are and how they move and stuff like that. We're just starting to scratch the head on prevention. So let's, let's keep on running down this way. So we did talk about Atlanta tick. It's a nice local product. Uh, it's getting great reviews. Like I said, once again, it's local and we love supporting local, especially for a small time uh, company like that. Uh, I'd rather Atlantic. Yeah, so Atlantic is all natural. And some of the things you can do around your house, especially for your animals and stuff like that, is you can grow specific types of plants uh, that will deter ticks. Now, will it get rid of them? No, but it does deter them, and that's the thing. And what's in this is lemongrass. Um, that'll deter them. Marigolds will tend to deter them. Mint, uh, types of mint will deter them. Um, so yeah, anything in that kind of variety. And once again, we suggest everybody does their, their research, literally just Google what plants deter ticks and you can see what to plant around your property. And a lot of these plants easy to grow. A lot of them are very weed like, uh, but you do have to put, you know, the foot effort into going out and planting them where you want and stuff like that. Especially if you put it through your fields and stuff like that. I know down in Marigamish, uh, had a property down there. Uh, I'm looking at putting in lemongrass and stuff like that to try and deter mosquitoes because I'm pretty sure Marigamish is the mosquito capital off North America and they're bred there to ship out to everybody else when they have deficiencies. I like Everybody's rolling their eyes back and laughing right now. Go to Marigamish and stay a night. That's all I can say. Like, Take your hammock, sleep outside. When you come back with three liters less blood, <laughs> we'll chat. I don't know, buddy. I've been in some places where mosquitoes are... Pretty horrendous. I know, and that's why I'm itching to get you down to Marigamish, because I think we're going to have a lot of fun. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so that's some natural things you can plant around. Uh, what's your thoughts, Ben? Natural uh, natural ways to keep ticks away from your property, specifically for, like, your chickens, dogs, cats, things like that. Well, the chickens themselves are a great control agent, because those guys will pick at anything and everything so if it's moving they're trying to eat it like they are voracious um they have killed every single blade of grass in the area i put their their run in and they killed it in like amazing time and now they're to the point where like if you open up the gate they're all their heads are out trying to get the bit of grass in front of the gate like they're they're ferocious with that um if i 100% trust that they'd come back when I called them, which I 100% don't believe they would do. I have plenty of green area behind my house that I would just let them go and clean that up because I'm sure they would just eliminate all the small vegetation and ticks. Um, so that is, in, in fact, the method of controlling them. Uh, other than that, yes, I'm, I'm sure there are plants you can grow that would deter them, that, that the scents they release uh, annoy them to the point where they'll just kind of avoid the area which is, is, is an awesome means. Also, just controlling your lawn, like keeping your lawn from getting too long and keeping uh, low br brush under control. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't have br brush and stuff, but just confine it to certain areas, areas you don't have to walk through or be part of. Um, because like you said, they don't, they're don't. not chasing you down. They're not little you know, monsters chasing you at high speed, they're just going to sit there and hang out. So as long as you're not brushing against them, they're not getting to you. Could you imagine if they were actively pursuing you? That'd be terrifying. There's, <laughs> yeah, there's enough things actively pursuing me as it is. I don't need to add to the list. <laughs> um, I've also heard ducks. The neighbors straight across from me, they keep ducks specifically to keep the tick population down for the rest of their animals. They got chickens and ducks and... I think I see goats over there and a few other things and pigs from time to time, but they just they have ducks and guinea hens. Uh, I heard guinea hens, I'm I'm told, are like amazing. That for 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 ticks, they are apparently like the way to go. And I I can't remember what someone said one time. It's like they will eat like a hundred or something a day each. I heard one guinea hen can literally maintain a one acre area off ticks because it's like one of their preferred foods which is great the downside of guinea hens they're not quiet and they have a horrendous screech like they're they're kind of your neighbors won't like you if you have guinea hens let's go with that so unless you have some room to let these things uh speak their voice 
uh, you better talk to your neighbors first. And Kirby just, uh, Rick Kirby just said guinea hens as well. And Steve, uh, Lower Burnings River is, uh, likes to breed the Nova Scotia mosquito population. That's what I've been saying, man. Like, if you haven't been there, you don't... Actually, Ben has been to Newfoundland, and there's some spots in Newfoundland in the swampy areas where there's some bad black flies and ticks. Or, sorry, black flies and mosquitoes. I think he has an idea. But it'll just be like going home for you, Ben, I swear. I, I have seen black flies and mosquitoes come out in, in clouds. Like... Literally, you couldn't penetrate what was on the other side. Like, it, they just came out like a mass. It was like nightmare stuff. Like, it's stuff that you, that I still can sometimes wake up thinking about. Like well, it, I it can't wait cool. to refresh those memories for you, Ben. That way you have new, <sighs> fresh horrors to think about. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so there is animal deterrence. There is plant deterrence. Uh, as yeah. Ben said, just maintain your yard. Keep it trimmed up. Uh, they generally like taller grass. And if you're saying to yourself, oh, I don't have ticks in my area, ask yourself this one question. Do you have deer? Do you see deer anywhere around you? Because if you say yes, you got ticks. That's as simple as it gets. You may not have a lot of ticks, but y'all got ticks. Yeah. Um, not to mention birds and stuff like that can bring them in, drop them off. That's how a lot of the populations get spread around with Lyme disease. Uh, they get attracted to a bird, bird flies, tick falls off, lays its eggs, boom, massive population. Because ticks don't weigh like six eggs. We're talking hundreds to thousands of eggs. Like, it's it's gross how many eggs will come out of a tick. <clears throat> uh, I tried to sell a house down, oh, down in American Mish, Burnish River. Yeah, no, Steve, I got you, man. That's where I'm from. I've lived and breathed that nightmare, uh, and now I'm trying to get back down there, which is funny enough. But, uh, so yeah, maintain your yard, plant some plants, uh, there's animals that you can buy that'll wean the ticks off. Now let's get into some of the topical, uh, thing. Well, no, 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 let's back up a little bit. For yourself, before you start reaching for the bug spray or your natural sprays and stuff like that, there's things that you can do that will lower your risk, or not maybe lower your risk, but help you see ticks that are on your body and prevent them from getting to your skin. And the big thing is tuck your clothes in. You're going to look goofy. I'm not going to lie. But when we worked at natural resources and we went to places like Lake Agmont, which is, it's hellacious how many ticks you can get there. I walked into a ditch to look for an eagle and I might've taught, said this story before, found the oh, yeah. eagle, it got away, came back out like 90 ticks on me, not embedded, but on my body, me and Matt at the time, we were pulling them off and counting them. There's like 90 ticks for a five. That's when you job. said you stopped doing it. Yeah, literally. Like, it was just like, screw this, we're done. We just brushed it off and off we went. It was a nightmarish amount of ticks. Anyway, what you do is you tuck your socks, or sorry, you tuck your pant legs into your socks. Looks well, goofy, I know, but now the ticks can't crawl up into your pant legs. Uh, tuck your shirt into your pants. It kind of makes this barrier where they have to just keep crawling up, and potentially once they get to your upper body, that's hopefully where you'll spot them, or somebody that's with you will spot them, and you can pick them off. If you've got a long sleeve shirt, it's even better. Uh, something with an elastic cuff is good. Turtlenecks look a little goofy, but once again, if you're that time of year and you can get a turtleneck on, that's basically putting them right to your head, and hopefully at that point they'll be spotted. Light-colored clothing, it's another good thing to wear, not because it deters them in any way, shape, or form, but you can easily spot them. So, I was actually in a meeting a little while ago, and a guy did an experiment, and he said it was brought on because of his gas can. So he had his gas can sitting out, and he picked it up, and he found, like, a dozen ticks hanging out on his gas can. So then he, t he did an experiment. He took three shirts, I think it was, a light shirt, a dark shirt, and an orange shirt, and he laid on the ground. And he said on his light shirt, he found, like, two or three ticks. On his dark shirt, he found four or five ticks. But on his orange shirt, he said he found a whole bunch, like, just a significant amount. So certain colors may or may not, like this was a semi-scientific, but it'd be worth trying to repeat and see if it's... It Is this redneck science? Redneck <laughs> it is redneck science. But, I mean, the guy who did it is, is somebody who I consider fairly intelligent and, and ca a capable individual that spends a lot of time in the woods and has probably tuned in here at least once or twice. Uh, and it was an experiment he did. And if he, if he wants to come in and talk about it, I, we will more than happily listen to it but it was an interesting conversation he had uh and the thing that really hit home for me is our as search and rescue we wear orange hunters uh, so if wear orange huh? hunters we all wear orange yeah usually so if it they are attacked at the orange that's something i want to be aware of 
but also they'll tend to show up on orange because black and orange are very good contrasting colors. Mm -hmm. Black and white are great contrasting colors. Black and black, not so much. Uh, so Steve mentioned gators, and I know this is something you want to talk about too. Yes. As soon as you mentioned this the other day, gators, uh, it, it has the same effect of having your socks tucked in. It's just a layer so that when they get onto your gator, they're not going to be able to go up inside your pants. And then you find them, like, sit on the back of your knees, in your groin area, and in and, and the back of your legs. It gives, gives them the access to those soft, fleshy parts that it can easily bite into and get to the blood. Um, and just gives you that extra layer of defense. So gators are an awesome method. I mean, it helps keep you cleaner and drier in the woods anyways, but it will help keep things like ticks and insects off of you. And if you've ever gone in the woods with, like, short socks or sandals where did you, where do you really get eaten it's your ankles they get tore up um sand flies are bad for it too but ticks mm. you know it's it's an it's an avenue so and rick uh, kirby made a great point here too he said he has shot and butchered deer in january that still had ticks on them um and i mean i've like literally last day hunting season here i've i'd take a deer and there'd still be lots of ticks on them in all honesty right. So no, we are. Nope. Go ahead. Sorry, Ben. So we are finding ticks year round. It, it, it is very much a real thing. Uh, so, you know, I a hundred percent believe people to say they are because like you said, it, if it's above zero ticks are most likely active and here in Nova Scotia, especially we have, you know, there's a year round. We have days that are in the plus, you know, in the winter we'll hit days that are minus 14, minus 20, but like, the day after, we could have 10. We've seen 30-degree shifts in, in weather. In, in a 24-hour period. Easy in the in weather. In a 24-hour period. Right. Um, uh, I did do some research while we are here, and one site even claimed that t that the guinea hen can consume 1,000 ticks a day. You know what? I believe it, because those little buggers will go. And they're much like a chicken. They scratch and they peck. And I, I've heard from many people that guinea hens are the way to get rid of ticks. I'm a yeah, firm believer, and let's buy, like, a thousands like let's mandate everybody has to own a guinea hen give it 10 years see what happens to the tick population <laughs> <laughs> i mean would it really be that bad i mean ticks are getting out of control here in nova scotia Look, what do you guys think out there maybe i'm crazy but i mean once upon a time we're talking you know a few years ago in the states they made it mandatory you had to grow hemp because it was uh, a renewable resource that could go towards making plastics, papers, a whole bunch of stuff. I can't remember which president it was. I'll think of it as soon as the show's over. But anyway, it was mandatory. Everybody had to grow some hemp. So what would be the difference if everybody had to own a guinea hen? Five years. At the end of your five years, whatever, eat the thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> but everybody owns a guinea hen. I, 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 I don't have a problem with your idea. They are allowed. They can be very annoying. My biggest concern is, have you heard of a thing called chicken math? Chicken meth? Math. Math. Okay. I was going to say chicken meth. No, I have not. But let's hear about chicken math, which is something else. Essentially, and people told me about this, you, you, you think I'll just get one or two chickens. And the next thing you know, you have 16 chickens and you're looking for more. Mm -hmm. Uh I think if you get one or two guinea hens, a lot of people will find that they now have a whole bunch of guinea hens and have no idea how they got them all, nor what to do with them all. They're just stuck now with a whole bunch of guinea hens. Um, they're very self-reliant animals, from my understanding. They love the free range. And if you have them, they're just going to go everywhere and, and eat insects and clean up things. But apparently they're not very damaging to, unlike chickens that will like decimate an area like yeah. they they don't they don't scratch as much um i like to with it without tearing and scratching up your garden so a chicken will tear up your garden will will like root out an area you know not quite as good as a as a, a pig but they're they're pretty efficient guinea hens will actually seek out the little insects and stuff and clean it up so they'll do a little less damage but they are loud and they're they can be annoying and they're as dumb as they come and they're not a very pretty animal. Well, some people think they're pretty. I they're don't think they're very pretty. Their feathers are they nice. Look... Their faces, something of nightmares. <laughs> I, I, I don't think they're that ugly. I guess they're not gorgeous by any means. Yeah, uh, it looks like somebody 
gave a turkey a short end of a stick. <laughs> it does kind of look like it's just wearing a skull. You know what I mean? <laughs> like and a big furry body with a tiny skull. Yeah, they're weird. Uh, so, Steve, look for the Sun Guard shirts meant for hot climates to protect from UV, but also you get good some coverage and designed for cool and light. Uh, I actually have some of these. I wear them when I, I work for safety services as a motorcycle instructor. That's why my weekend gigs. That's exactly what I wear. I bought them specifically for that. We're on black asphalt, gets hot. They breathe great. I also wear them into the woods. Um, I think I wore my orange one the time we went out and did the hammock video. But uh, I have since gotten bright green or yellow, whatever you want to call it. And man, those things show bugs great. So I agree with Steve on this one. Um, and they're not expensive. I got them from Amazon. I think I bought two of them for 14 bucks. So. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Otherwise. Yeah. So we've talked animals. We've talked, you know, prepare your clothes. Maybe plant some plants around your building or your property. So let's get to the meat and potatoes. Let's talk about topical applications that will help prevent ticks. Now there is homeopathic or natural stuff, and that was the Atlantic tick that we talked about, and you can find the link in the um, description of this video. Uh, and that's a great thing. That That's an all-natural thing. It's It runs off lemongrass, I think you said, is the main ingredient into that. Yes. Uh, and tea tree oil and a few other things. Like I said, I know lemongrass... Or lemon oil, uh, tea tree, mints, things like that. That they'll deter ticks. I don't know if it's a deterrent from the smell of the product itself, or if it more blocks uh, the product from giving off your own. Like, have you heard this? It's carbon dioxide. It's literally the carbon dioxide in your body that these bugs are attracted to. And once again, I'm not an expert, but that's what I've heard. It's the carbon dioxide and the carbon monoxide and stuff like that that get attracted to. It's living things give off these uh, products as you know. Yeah. the after effects of respiration and that's what they hone in on so maybe it masks the scent to that i don't know the specifics behind it but i do know that they do have pretty good success with it especially with kids where you don't want to get them into the uh you know the heavy chemicals like deet and deet being the real big one yeah deet uh yeah deet potentially does some health concerns i think there is some I, i'm trying to remember what they used to list it as is, is maybe a, a potential carcinogen. Which is uh, that's the other one I was trying to think of. Sorry. Yeah. Um. Yeah, there was something else going through my head. Um, bugs, but uh, there used to be a Russian guy on YouTube. He's probably still there. I just haven't watched him in a while. He talked about what the Russians did, and it's a tick trap right built into their clothing. Mm, you've told me about this before, but please explain, because I'll butcher it. So, on the Russian military uniform, they said every few inches up the pants, they had a flap of material. And it kind of reminds me of, if you ever see those zip-off pants with the zippers hidden up under a flap, that just runs all the way around the clothing, and, it, and it's kind of loose. And what they say is the tick will climb, climb up and get stuck in under that flap and just stay there. So, if they're walking through thick brush or anything... When they come out, if they wonder if they picked up any tick, they'll actually just lift the flaps up and look. And if there's any any ticks there, then they know that they've been exposed to a tick contaminated area, and they can just brush them off and continue on, on right? So kind of a quick, easy, cheap method to if you can get that with those little flaps or something to crawl into. Um, I'd be interested to see how well it works honestly like i'm sure there it definitely works to some degree i understand the principle behind it i would be very curious to try and put a head to head comparison between something like uh the atlantic which is you know a natural chemical based product a deep based product um what's the other one starts with i i can never remember the name of it ben replacement I? for deep No, I don't know anyway, when it starts. Mel will walk by and I'll hit her up for it. Um, <laughs> I'd like to try and put some of these things head to head. Like, go to a known tick area. So, I mean, I might actually do this because ticks used to 100% creep me out. But as since, I've gotten a little bit more used to them. Uh, I'd like to try this. I might put, like, some on one leg and something on the other leg and put a couple of those folds up and see how it all goes. But anyway, I'd like to try some of this different stuff. Um... And then, of course, there's this one. I can't remember what it is that's the DEET replacement. I'll have to look it up. But DEET. DEET is a big one. Everybody likes uh, to mention. And honestly, it works. 
I mean, uh, there's a reason that a lot of stuff has DEET in it. It's because it does work. The downside of DEET is uh, it's not really great for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, any, anytime you can reduce the amount of chemicals you're putting onto your body, you're probably helping yourself out a bit. You know what I mean? And that's just it. And the higher DEET percentage you get, it's kind of the worse off it is. Um, I have some musk oil or musk oil or whatever you want to call it here. And it's actually their tick formula. Uh, once again, we're not sponsored by these people or anything like that. I happened to just pick it up because I was going to throw it in the truck simply because it said tick formula. And I was interested to see if it was any better on ticks than their normal formula. And I honestly, when you read the active ingredients, I'm pretty sure this is probably just some marketing mobo, uh, mumbo jumbo. They relabeled it, stuck a dollar more onto it, and they're like, oh, yeah, this is great for ticks, when it's honestly the exact same product, which is my suspicions. But anyway, it's 30% DEET, which is calm, and you get that in deep woods off and stuff like that. And that's a pretty good number for the majority of uh, bugs and things like that you're going to find in the woods. Once upon a time, musk oil used to make these little bottles of stuff. Uh, it was still musk oil, but it was 50% DEET, uh, and it was great. Problem was, it would eat plastic. Like, it was oh, not yeah. good for you. I dropped some on my pencil, you know, the pencil boxes you used to get in school. I had one of those as a chainsaw box, had my files and stuff like that in it, and I had my bottle with musk oil in it, and it broke open. Literally ate a hole in the bottom of the box over the course of, like, two days. Yeah. Imagine putting that on your skin. Like, that's not going to be good. And everybody's like, oh, you're not supposed to put it on your skin, you put it on your clothes. Let's not lie to each other. We all give our spray on our skin. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes, you spray your pants, you spray your shirt, but of course, some goes on your arms, some goes on your neck. It's not supposed to. I understand that. I'm not telling you to put it on your skin, but some always goes on those areas. Now, imagine that item that's eating plastic being on your skin, and that's kind of the deterrent with uh, uh, Picardin and DEET. They're not really great for your skin. Picaritin may be a little better than DEET. It's debatable. Do your research. But that's kind of the drawback to some of these things. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, and a lot of clothing is made of a polyester like they they recommend you don't wear a lot of the natural products in woods because it it holds moisture longer so they recommend polyesters and stuff what is that doing to that clothing that's a good question right not only that it like it could deteriorate your gear it removes waterproofing off a lot of stuff uh yeah. as rick kirby saying here deep will also remove the paint from your truck ask him how i know exactly how you know because, uh, honestly, DEET is like a step away from being brake cleaner in my mind. It is harsh stuff. It works. No argument. It works, but it's harsh. Yeah. Um, so, a lot of people don't like that, and that's why you mentioned the natural stuff, and the Sawyer's product works good, and the pe Pectorin, or whatever the heck I'm trying to say here, it works. Pretty sure that the Pyrethrian uh, is what Sawyer sells. Now, Picardin is the other one I'm thinking. I thought there was one that started with I. I'd almost have to go get the bottle, and I can't think of it. Um, here, just hold on one sec. Uh, Incardin is the one I was looking for. Icardin, sorry. Icardin. Uh, and you see that in a lot of, like, uh, kid-friendly sprays, I believe, is what they uh, put it out to. But they still also tell you, do not put it on your skin. Citronella, it's another one that you can get. Uh, I actually bought stickers. They're smiley face stickers. And you yeah. stick them on your skin. That's what I got for Lily. Uh, if anybody's wondering, Lily's my daughter, she's five, we don't put the chemicals directly on her skin, we use these stickers, and they work great for mosquitoes, and black flies, and things like that, would I trust them with ticks? Absolutely not. If she's going somewhere where there's ticks, uh, long pants, socks are gonna be tucked into them, like, just what we talked about, yeah, we're gonna look ridiculous walking through the woods, but guess what? Chances are we're gonna see the ticks before they come a problem. Uh... Anything else you want to add into, like, the spray-on topicals? And, I mean, you're, pick your poison when it comes to brand name. This just happened to be the one I purchased because I was curious about it. There's Just look at the deep content, and honestly, after that, you're just paying for whatever your favorite brand is. My opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but, I mean, it's all the same in my mind. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, there's plenty of products out there, you know, you, you kind of have to try to do yeah, I don't want to get to the point where we're just saying buy this product, don't buy that product, because you know what wor works in one spot may not even work as well in another spot. Um, but there's there's definitely a lot of options. If there, uh, avoidance is is usually better than treatment. You know what I mean? Like if you can avoid there the worst areas, but that sometimes means not getting it in the woods, and that's not an option for us. So when you get to that. Um, 
And honestly, that's kind of where I'm at. I, I do the pant tucking thing. I give a couple sprays off whatever DEET I happen to be having around. A little on my legs, a little on my shirt. Uh, everybody's seen my big brown hat, a couple sprays on that. And I just go off into the woods. And whatever will be, will be when it comes to ticks. You know what I mean? Originally, do you the, concentrate it on areas where they're most likely to get in through? Like on, on your sleeves, your ankles? Waist uh, down, yeah. in all honesty. From the waist down is where the majority of yeah. deke goes. And then the waist up, it's just kind of a light spritzing more for mosquitoes. I figure if yeah. they make it through everything that's on my pants down, um, whatever I put on my upper body is not going to deter them anymore. You yeah. know what I mean? And mm -hmm. what I am a big fan of, which uh, we were kind of leading in here, is once you get to where you're going, uh, be it in the woods or once you get home from the woods, tick checks. Tick checks are a thing in our house. Like... Everybody that knows Mel and I, they laugh because we'll call tick check when we come out of the woods. Like uh, Jeff and Kathy, Melissa's parents, they were here. We came out of the woods once. We came in, we dropped our bags, we looked at each other, and we just went tick check, tick check. And they just start laughing. They're like, what is this? And we're like, no, it's a real thing. Like you get home, you check yourself for ticks. And if you have somebody else that you can, you're comfortable getting more uh, revealing around have them check you they can see spots where you can't see they can get into your hair they can see your back under your arms stuff like that better uh, just do a tick check that is your best method after the fact if you can see it and remove it it's no longer a problem don't just blow in throw your stuff in the corner flop in the couch and start cracking back cold ones if there was a tick that was like on your pants it can crawl from your pants and eventually get up onto your skin i have um even after tick checks, I've gotten back. Actually, when we went to the waterfall, the yeah. next day, I found a tick crawling on my pillow. And I had done a tick check, washed all my clothes, had a shower. I mean, and it was still there. So obviously yeah. it got somewhere. It, it didn't have any blood in it. It was just crawling around being stupid. So I killed it and that was the end of it. But I mean, it, it's still a real thing. Like I told you, I've seen ticks crawl out of the dryer after going through a hot water cycle and a hot dryer. Yeah. And just bloop, bloop, out they come and they don't care anymore. They are an incredibly resilient bug. And that's why, if you can see them and remove them, it's no longer a problem. Like, prevention is great, but then after prevention's done, because once again, all deterrents. These things don't kill ticks. They don't give you a 100% guarantee that you're not going to get a tick on you or anything like that. It just helps. Every little bit that you get helps once you get home. You got to be proactive. Give yourself a good searching. And I mean, it's not hard. Take your hand, run it down your arm, the rest of your body. You're just feeling for anything that shouldn't be there. And I like, it's going to feel like a pine needle or something like that. And you're just like, oh, what's that? And you give it a flick. Oh, it's a pine needle. Oh, you know, it's, it's whatever. It's a maple seed. And I found some weird stuff stuck to my body. I'm not going to lie. Like, how the hell did a makeable seed get to the back of my leg? And you just go on. But I've also found a lot of ticks. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's all it is. Just a kind of a quick wipe. Anything that feels like it shouldn't be there. Give it a little bit of investigation. And I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ben. I was thinking. I think we've covered that pretty good. Uh, yeah. In the end, what we're looking for is to identify when we need to be checking them. So, if you see any sign of ticks, or if you've gone through thick brush, it's a good time to do a check then. Um, you know, if you can treat your clothing with anything that's like a repellent uh, or has some some effect on them. That's definitely a good go-to. <laughs> right. Keep going. You're good. I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> and then, you know, just keep being aware. I think the more aware you are and the more you check, because if you can get them early, like a tick will oftentimes hang out on you for even hours before it actually will bite, like sink in. Oh, yeah. So if you're pretty vigilant, you you can get them and get them off and, and deal with them. And my favorite method of getting rid of them is once they're off and removed, not while they're still attached to me, but it's, it's the, is to burn them because it's pretty well foolproof. You know, a few things come back from fire. That is true. If you get anything hot enough, it'll burn. Like, don't... I hate when people say, oh, that doesn't burn. It doesn't burn under normal temperature. <laughs> you just got to increase the temperature and it will burn. Trust me. There's nothing yeah, on this planet right. that doesn't have a burning point. So according to Robert, everything is flammable. It's just how hard are you trying? How much heat are you willing to put in to get it going? You know what I mean? Um, so something that I'd rather be outside said gators work great. We talked about that a little earlier. Just somebody else saying that again. Uh, I don't own a pair of gators. Really want to get a pair. Ben has spoke highly off them. 
Uh, so I do think they're on my list of stuff to do. And what I was laughing at Ben is this final comment. At the end of the episode, will Ben share his barber's name? That's a snappy awesome hairdo, bro. Is that a home job or did you get it professionally done? Wow. Oh, I, <laughs> I don't know if that's his comment or not. I think it's a legitimate pat on the back. It's a good hairdo, Ben. I'm not going to lie, bud. It looks good on you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, if you really want to know her name, you can uh, message us and I will give it to you. I can set you up. I hope you're local and willing to go you know, meet up with her. It's Steve. <laughs> He's down here with me. So if it is good enough, I'm sure Hezkar will travel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, ah, oh, damn, I had a last thought i wanted to say but it's gone so it's a lie don't worry about it should i be <laughs> no it's totally gone so i guess what's your guys' thoughts do you have any of uh tick methods that you guys have go to like i've heard the old duct tape backwards on your pant legs they'll crawl up to that and it'll stick uh they definitely will stick I mean, I've never tried it. I've heard it. I've heard other methods. What What do you guys think? We love to hear your guys' two cents on this. Uh, and Steve said it was a legitimate compliment. So, um, <laughs> Thanks, Steve. It's, uh, what, what's your guys' thoughts? Is there anything that you guys have a go-to that works really well? Because as guys and gals that go in the woods and people that listen to this, I'm sure that information would be greatly appreciated to be passed along and passed on. Uh, and I mean, if it sounds ridiculous, but it works, it's not ridiculous. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh. I agree. I was going to say you're answering Steve, aren't you? <laughs> well, I, I just pulled up her, her, uh, her messenger. So <laughs> fair enough. Um, I, I think that's it for me tonight. Ben, do you have any closing thoughts, bud? No, uh, it's a great topic. It's a topic we have brought up before and it's a topic that will probably be brought up again honestly ticks are a a real concern in the woods i mean there are things in the woods that that concern us and honestly i think we are more concerned with ticks than most wild animals like you know i don't think there's a mammal bird or reptile that we are more concerned about in the woods than some of these insects because they really can ruin your trip at least here uh, in nova scotia Get to Australia, yeah. game changes. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, still, honestly, even in Australia, insects are a huge concern. Of mine. Oh, no, I'm just saying it's not specifically ticks. Yeah. I mean, there's a country that has, what, uh, seven of the ten most deadly animals on the planet jammed into one little country? I have some worries there. Not that I wouldn't go. I love the opportunity. I just want somebody that has more experience with those animals than me spearheading the expedition because i'd walk us right into a viper's den like you know what i mean I, this looks great somebody behind me be like he's gonna be dead so i know where my limitations are yeah. uh but yeah no uh, you know insects you mentioned like the mosquitoes and stuff down your way um yeah that can make your trip miserable so taking the precautions using products that that minimize or eliminate the threat i mean there are a few there's a lot of amazing products out there, and I've seen people swear by them. I haven't had a chance to test them all by any means. Uh, but if anyone ever gets really bored and wants us to do a thorough test of every insect, to just send us a significant amount of cash, and we will go out in the woods and see what actually works the best. You had me at send a significant amount of cash. <laughs> <laughs> because it would cost a small fortune. I, I just sent you a product that's a tick trap. Yep, uh, I was looking at it there. Right. 50 bucks there's these little tubes with the cotton in them and they must have some chemical ticks go in and they don't come out you know and i'd be curious how to use these you must just throw them around your garden i mean it's pretty simple to tap trap a tick at integrated pest management we did tick studies and stuff like that like don't think that we got this fancy equipment that you get these ticks and things are good there's two ways we trapped them you put a container at the bottom of a tree and gave it a shake or it's basically a bed sheet on a hockey stick you drag through long grass that's it there's nothing fancy about this stuff. <laughs> Get the tick trap, honey. Okay. Yeah. Got to bring out the good sheets again. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the reality of it. You just drag it along. Whatever sticks to the sheet is good to go. Yeah. But, no, I can see that working very well. Um, 
last thing I just want to bring up at the end of this, not really tick related, but in two episodes ago, we mentioned that we are putting the offer out there for you folks to join us on a venture going out. We have had a pretty good response back onto that. Still planned for October. Uh, most of the important players in that, uh, you know, the close supporters of Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures, uh, we've been chatting to them, seeing if any weekends work better than other. It seems like it's going to be a pretty good run uh, for everybody, nobody really has any qualms on any weekend we go to there, so hopefully in the next little bit we'll decide on an exact weekend, we'll get it out to the U folks, and hopefully we get a few more coming in. Right now it seems to be like, if everybody comes that said they would, we're sitting at like seven or eight people, not including you and I, Ben. Wow. That's, that's a party for me. That's that like... is a party. Uh, we're, like I said, it's all, of course, COVID-based... We're following the rules. We're not breaking any rules. We don't want anyone to break any rules. But outside, I think we're good up to 50 or something, as long as we maintain uh, social distancing without masks. So, I mean, I'm pretty sure we can find 10 feet in between each other. Uh, or what is it? Six feet in between each other in the woods somewhere. But anyway, so far, things are going out good. If you're still interested in that and you're listening to this, definitely check us out. Check out the website, theatlanticbushcraft.ca, which you can see down there. You can contact us at podcastatlanticbushcraft.ca and say, hey, yeah, I'm interested in that. There's a contact us page on our website. You can message us on Facebook. You can shoot us a message on YouTube. Shoot us a message on Instagram. We even have Twitter. Uh, don't get me wrong. Ben and I are not techno gurus in any way, shape, or form. If you don't see us on these mediums, it's not because we don't want to be on these mediums. The chances are we don't understand how to fully use these these mediums uh but if you send us a message i have learned that my phone will ding and i can reply back <laughs> so definitely shoot us a message and we'll get through to you somehow yeah uh ditto on that uh we we have tried we tried hard to use some of these mediums uh and i'm not saying it, that we can't we, we definitely are capable of it's just that the effort to do it is greater than it should be for us i'm just starting to get the hang of instagram and we've been on that since we started atlantic bushcraft which was two years ago and i'm just yeah. starting to get the hang of it somebody asked me the other day why don't you go on tiktok first of all i'm not a hundred percent sure what tiktok is yet second of all i don't know how to do tiktok i have a figured out how to watch tiktok which is great I have tried three or four times to put something on there, and I fail miserably every time because I'm just not happy with the results. So, And I'm no better. I mean, I used to code HTML, and you can see it on our website. That is where my knowledge ends. I tried to do Twitter. Makes no sense. Tried to do Instagram. I'm just figuring it out two years later. It's not that we don't want to be on these mediums. We have no idea what we're doing. But please, get a hold of us. We can at least work a keyboard and type you back. We have no idea what we're doing. That, that could be our motto. I mean, it's not wrong. <laughs> we have no a general we... gist of what we're doing. <laughs> we have no idea what we're doing, but we are still moving ahead. <laughs> That's my motto for life right there. That's not just Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. That is how I live day to day. <laughs> oh, you look confused. You're right. I am 100% of the time. <laughs> anyway, that's it for me tonight, folks. Yeah, we're definitely getting tired. Yeah. <laughs> Night, Talk everybody. To you later, guys. Get out there, have fun. <laughs>